Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, where we discuss infamous cases of death and murder that have an element of food to them, and then I cook or sometimes sample the food from the case. If you want to support me, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. You can also join my Patreon. I'm Dining with Death on Patreon. I'm Stacy Lee. Let's begin. This episode was suggested by my viewer, Mele Kavrik Resmi. I'm very sorry about my pronunciation, but I wanted to give a shout out for the suggestion. Most of us true crime lovers focus on the Big Ten, the most famous and most notorious serial killers in history. And those tend to be the American killers because Hollywood makes movies about those killers, movies that are seen all over the world. But the fact is, there are serial killers in every country, on every continent of the world, and some of them are even more evil and more prolific than the ones so many of us are familiar with. Today we are talking about one of those men, and oof, was he ever a monster. Lam Kor Wan was born in British Hong Kong on May 22, 1955. His father worked for a petroleum company, and it was difficult for him to see his children. Lam lived with his mother and siblings in her company provided housing. In 1962, the family moved into the heart of Hong Kong and Lam enrolled at an elementary school. He was very smart and almost always in the top 10 percentile every time he was tested. He was well liked and he was good in school. But then in 1970, when Lam was 15, his father opened a motorcycle shop and pretty much forced Lam to work there every single day after school. His father didn't allow Lam a social life, and this led to a lot of resentment from Lam towards his father. Before long, Lam's grades began to suffer. He became angry and depressed, and it seems he lost his motivation. He continued working in his father's shop for years, and then took a job as an air conditioning tech at a relative's company. For a while, Lam seemed to be simply aimless, but soon he turned violent. In 1973, Lam had a very serious fight with his father, which resulted in Lam's father throwing him out of the house and forbidding him to ever return. This story is such a great example of how regardless of culture or race or country of origin, killers are all very much alike in some ways. Just like we see all the time, Lam started out with crimes that could be considered not that serious. I don't look at it that way because this is what I do all day. I look at the kind of thing Lam does next as very much a warning and very much a red flag. But basically what he did was he was in a public park and a woman went into one of the restrooms there and Lam followed her into the restroom and pulled out a knife and held a knife to her throat. Didn't hurt her, did not assault her in any way, but... Um, if you think like I do, stalking a woman and pulling a knife on her is just about as serious as it gets. And then there will be other people that will say, well, that happens a hundred times a day in the streets of New York, or that happens a thousand times a day in LA or Miami. It's just perspective, I guess. Fortunately, the authorities did take this attack quite seriously. And Lam was arrested for the crime and hospitalized. A doctor had determined that he was clinically depressed. So his family began to discuss Lam, and as they did, some information became more openly talked about. Lam had been caught by several family members peeping on his own sisters and sisters-in-law as they showered. So when that information came out, his hospital stay was extended. Another behavior that can be seen as boys will be boys, I really don't like that term, or it can be seen as something very serious, which is the way I see it. Peeping and voyeurism, looking at people who do not know they're being watched, big red flag, big red flag. So Lam is now out of the hospital. His family starts talking about the fact that he's been a peeping Tom, he's committed this act against this woman in the park, and they're trying to find him, find some direction. So guess what Lam does? Just like Rodney Alcala, Bob Bradella, Harvey Glattman, he decides to take up photography. Now look, I'm a photographer. I love taking pictures. I've done all kinds of photography. I've done boudoir photography for women. I've done family photos. I've done really artsy, creative photos. I've done photos for my band. And I've met a lot of photographers. <laughs> Being a photographer doesn't mean you're a creep, but there is a portion of people who are interested in photography that I think have a voyeuristic tendencies. 
Ooh, I'm going to make some people mad with that one. But Lamb decided he was going to get into photography, and that's exactly what he did. For a while, it seemed a genuine interest. But then suddenly, Lamb dropped out of photography school and started driving a cab. About this same time, again, this is something we see over and over, his mothers and his sisters noticed a stark change in Lamb's behavior and in his appearance. Lamb stopped bathing, he stopped eating regularly, and he drank a lot. As we know, these are very classic signs of mental illness, and there was no question that Lamb was very, very depressed. Unfortunately, he was also in a perfect occupation for someone with his proclivities. In his capacity as a cab driver, Lamb would often pick up prostitutes to drive them to and from their homes or to and from their client houses or motel rooms. Later, women would report that they hated riding in Lamb's cab because they were worried he was going to crash. He did not pay attention to the road and he did not pay attention to his driving. He was paying attention to them. He spent the time in the car trips staring at women in the rearview mirror or turning completely around to stare at them. He was obsessed with women, but mainly he was obsessed with their skin. He liked to talk to women about their skin, and at times he would even try and touch them. As disturbing as that behavior is, it soon became much, much worse. On February 3rd, 1982, this woman, 22-year-old Chan Feng Lan, who worked as a dancer in a nightclub, disappeared. She had been having drinks with friends at Chinese Palace Nightclub on Kimberley Road. Sadly for her, Chan was picked up by Lam, who drove her near his home, but first stopped at his own house to pick up an electrical cord. He then got back in the cab and used the electrical cord to strangle Chan in the back of the cab. Lam then took Chan's body home and hid it under the sofa. Lam had roommates, and he didn't want them alerted to what was happening. He waited for all of them to leave the house, and then he used Chan's money from her wallet to purchase an electric saw. He took Chan's body out from underneath the couch and removed her clothing. He then put his photography skills to use, taking many, many photos of her naked body. This is definitely a horror movie, true crime story. The photography is bad. It gets so much worse. Lam then dismembered Chan, keeping her sex organs for himself. He placed them in a jar and filled the jar with rice vinegar to preserve the body parts. He then wrapped the other seven parts of her body in newspaper and threw them in the Xingmun River. Those parts later washed ashore. I also need to carefully tell you that Lam not only took photos during the acts that I'm going to talk about and just talked about, he made little movies. He took videos. The videos had names, but I'm worried about saying some of them. Um, whatever you're thinking, it's worse. It's worse. A few months later, on May 29th, 1982, 31-year-old Chan Wan Kit got into Lam's cab on Wusung Street. Lam attacked her, handcuffing her and strangling her with the same electrical cord he'd used before. He took her body home where he removed everything that made her female and preserved those parts in glass jars using embalming fluid. The rest of her body was wrapped and dumped on the side of a hill. The following morning in June of 1982, 29-year-old Lung Sao Wan met a similar fate. This time the body was taken home where Lam took his time. I cannot go into the details of what he did, but this time he decided he would like to taste the insides. After he did that, he removed parts and preserved them in glass jars. A few weeks later, 17-year-old Lung Wai Sum was picked up by Lam. I can't really tell you much of what was done to her, but it was horrific. At this point in time, Lam had a secret compartment inside his flat full of glass jars containing parts, all preserved for future use. And this is where this killer gets his moniker. You may have heard, the Jars Murderer. There is conflicting information online about the Jars murderer. There are sites that claim he took four victims and sites that claim he took six victims and sites that claim six is conservative. And there were in fact many, many more. 
The murders went unsolved for years, and then in 1985, police launched a massive investigation into the series of murders, and it became the largest manhunt in Hong Kong's history at the time. The investigation included hundreds of police officers and forensic experts, and it relied heavily on the use of new forensic technologies to analyze evidence. The police were not having a lot of luck in identifying the killer, but then Lam did something really, really foolish. Come with me back to prehistoric times, the 1980s, where you had to have a camera with film in it to take pictures. And after you took those pictures, you had to take the film to a drugstore or a camera store that would develop the film for you. Now, a lot of you know this, but I'm gonna say this to preserve it for future watching. When you dropped your film off, they gave you a little paper envelope. You put the film in, you sealed the envelope up, and then you wrote your information on the envelope. After your film was developed, they would call you and tell you to come pick up your pictures. Now, keep in mind, the person who was developing your pictures saw them as they were being developed. So Lam takes a roll of film in to be developed, and the technician that is developing the film is looking at the photos and cannot believe what they're seeing. Thankfully, this person was a see something, say something person, thankfully, and they called the police. Police arrived at the camera shop and looked at the photos and just really could not believe what they were seeing. At first, they wondered if someone was making a horror film, but as they went through the photos, they knew this guy was no filmmaker. He wasn't a special effects artist, and he would have had to have been to produce the horrific things they were seeing, unless the things they were seeing were real, which sadly, they were. The police went to Lam's flat, a flat he shared with his brother and several other people. Lam was arrested at his home. After he was taken into custody, the police began to investigate the house. They especially wanted to find the rooms where the photos had been taken and find it, they did. In that room is where police found all the jars, the jars containing preserved body parts as well as other incriminating evidence. Lam's case received widespread media attention in Hong Kong and beyond, with many reports focusing on his lurid crimes and bizarre behavior. In particular, people were fascinated with his use of the jars to store and preserve body parts. It stood out as a particularly gruesome and macabre element of the case. People were shocked and sickened by not only the murders, but by what had been done to these poor women after they were killed, by what Lam had kept for himself. Lam had even taken selfies of himself with the bodies as he was engaged in what he was doing. Lam went to trial for his disturbing and dark crimes and he was found guilty and sentenced to death, but his sentence was later commuted to life in prison. Despite his notoriety, Lam has remained largely out of the public eye since his conviction and there is little information available on his life behind bars. He remains one of the most infamous serial killers in the history of Hong Kong, but we really don't know much about what has happened to him in the last decade or so. We do know that he is currently serving his life sentence at the maximum security Shek Pik prison. Lam said to his prison psychiatrist, Dr. William Green, that he, quote, ate part of the intestine of one of his victims, and that his motivation was not primarily sexual, but that it, quote, was sexual, and it was God who told him to kill the victims. Like many who came before him and many that will come after, Lam chose to blame God and mom and dad and everyone else but himself for his terrible behavior. We all have choices, and regardless of the way we were raised or the things we experienced as children, the fact remains, most of us choose not to become monsters. Most of us. I did a lot of research on the food in the downtown Hong Kong scene, and Hong Kong has a lot of very famous dishes. They don't have one official dish, but the consensus seems to be that if they did, it would be what I'm gonna cook for you now, sweet and sour pork. Let's go dining with death. Okay, we've had a little wrinkle in the plan here. Um, when you guys see this episode on June 22nd, I will have been in California for two weeks. And by the time I leave here, I will have been here for a month. In order for me to leave for a month to go on the road with this one, the amount of research, writing, and filming that I have to do is 
It's Absol- a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I just didn't get to this. So I figured, well, I'll cook it in my hotel room. So I brought my little burner. I went to the store this morning. I got all the ingredients, got my makeup on, pulled everything out. I'm getting ready to cook. And this one yeah. decides to inform me of something he chose not to tell me last year. You're not supposed to cook in your hotel rooms because you can set the fire alarm off. Last year in Sacramento, he almost got kicked out of the hotel and set the fire alarm off and had the fire department called on him because he was cooking in the room. I was. You just didn't think that was something I would want to know? Nah. (laughs) Didn't even bother to tell me. So please forgive the shit show that our life has been lately. Between this and Firefall and... (laughs) Fire fail. fire fail. We're now yeah. calling it fire fail. Um, but I was going to cook in the hotel room for you. Instead, we're going to take you to dinner. So let's go get sweet and sour pork. <laughs> we are here in Fresno at the Four Seasons Chinese Restaurant. It's a very classic place. I always love these placemats. They remind me of when I was a little kid with the Zodiacs on them. It looks like maybe this was a barbecue restaurant or a famous Dave's before because of the log cabin feel to it. I'm super excited for this, you guys. Look at the dim sum menu. Looks so good. And right at the top there is sweet and sour pork, which is really kind of considered the official dish of Hong Kong. So we will definitely be getting that and some other things as well. Okay guys, here it is, the sweet and sour pork. They brought it first. The kind of unofficial official dish of Hong Kong. It smells amazing, very bright and tangy and acidic. We're gonna give it a taste. See that glaze on there? It smells incredible. Mm. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you think there, Jason? It's got good flavor. It's got really good flavor. It's kind of garlicky. Hot. Mm-hmm. Temperature hot. It is really good. I would have loved to have made this for you guys. It's been a really long time since I made this. We also ordered Mongolian beef. Look at that. Doesn't that look good? Here is the Mongolian beef. It's really good, but it's spicy. Looks good, doesn't it? I keep forgetting I've got the microphone plugged in. And I can't hold the mic and eat at the same time, but this has really good flavor. Oh my goodness, look at the chicken egg foo young. Jason loves egg foo young. He gets it wherever we go. And you know, it's one of those dishes, sometimes it's really, really good. And sometimes it's not so good. This one looks incredible. Here is our dim sum. We got shumai. Those look amazing and chewy and delicious. chopsticks so I'm embarrassed using a fork but some of these places don't because a lot of people don't like them but there is the dim sum the shumai Mm. okay I'm going to be honest with you after a second the dim sum the shumai got a little um, barnyardy for me and for Jason. You know, it had the, some has pork, has that. And it got a little barnyardy for me, so that was not my favorite. I sometimes won't even order sweet and sour pork because the pork is a little gamey. But this one is good. I'm a vegetable person, so the Mongolian beef is my favorite. 
Really good because it's got all the crisp vegetables and it's a lot fresher. Sometimes deep fried things are just a little heavy for me, but I like the Mongolian beef a lot. So all in all, a really good meal at a cute little place, really good service and really solid food. Okay, we're back at the hotel room. It was good. It was good. The shumai was not, not my thing. A little, little gamey. Yeah, pork sometimes can be a little gamey. We had a pork shop at a German restaurant a little while ago that was yeah. not my thing. You, pork, you pork. You know what you're talking about when you say gamey. If yeah, know. if you've had gamey pork that tastes of the barnyard, that's kind of not my thing. But everything else was good. Mm -hmm. Flavorful, so, good portions too. Yeah, really huge portions. Jason's got a whole sack of stuff to take to his guys. Yeah for dinner tonight so oh, they're they're all going to be eating <laughs> chinese food yeah, it was flavorful. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for coming along on our little misadventure here again i really would have loved to cook sweet and sour pork for you it's been a while since i made that so i was actually kind of looking forward to it but um well it was a fire department free day <laughs> That's good. That's always a good thing. We didn't get the fire department called on us. Exactly. Although you and I might have to have a little chat about the things you're not telling me. You know, remember last year when he got like They're well documented when he got raided when he was at that Airbnb and the SWAT team burst in and handcuffed him and threw him yeah. on the ground. Oh. <laughs> Airbnbs are out for a while. Airbnb, we are done with Airbnbs. We are done, done, done with Airbnb after that. He, you could have been killed. Stockton, you realize you could have been killed. Stockton's a little rough. Yeah, he spent like two hours in his underwear in handcuffs sitting on the couch of a drug house that he didn't know was a drug house that he rented on Airbnb. It's a very nice Airbnb. <laughs> Except for that. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're steering clear. Yeah. <laughs> and the fire department, we don't need that, especially after fire fail. No, fire fail. <laughs> We've had enough. Oh. So thank yeah. you guys for coming along on our little journey and coming to eat dinner with us. We yeah. sure appreciate you, and I Absolutely. hope you have a great day. I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>